Wow, it's amazing to see everybody here. This is really, really cool. So what I get to talk about today uh, is specifically the Aragon network. And we heard a little bit about this um, in some of the earlier presentations. But if you're not familiar with what the Aragon network is, um, it's been a goal of the project since the very beginning to use the infrastructure and the tools that we're building to operate uh, an organization governed by ANT holders. Um, and the goal of this organization is to serve as a digital jurisdiction. Um, and sometimes I, I, I use the word digital jurisdiction when I'm talking to people and people are like, what, what is that? Um, and you can kind of think about this like a traditional jurisdiction like Delaware, um, but designed for the, the unique properties of fully digital blockchain native organizations. Um, and what that means is that this digital jurisdiction is going to provide some of the same things that a traditional jurisdiction might uh, provide as well. So like the infrastructure, the tools for record keeping, all these things, as well as dispute resolution um, when disputes inevitably occur. Um, and so why do we need a digital jurisdiction as opposed to our traditional legacy jurisdictions? Why are we so trying to solve this problem? Um, and fundamentally, this is because we believe that anyone anywhere should be able to work with anybody else. Um, and the internet has, has kind of made this possible broadly today. Um, I can use GitHub, I can use instant messaging, I can talk to somebody across the globe, and we can work on a project. Um, but currently, like, those relationships uh, are hard to formalize. It's, it's hard to actually formalize that into an actual business, a formal business arrangement that provides uh, guarantees. Um, and, and it's unfortunate. This is confusing and expensive, and people really don't do this, at least at the, the scale uh, that we would like to see. Um, and even if you do manage to kind of like jump through those hurdles and you, you decide to incorporate somewhere and, and you're working with people across the globe, um, the choice of jurisdiction that you pick may actually put some of the participants in that organization at an extreme disadvantage. Picking a, a specific jurisdiction means that you're, um, you're providing advantages based on nationality and geography um, and even culture. Um, so if you're working with people that don't necessarily share those same qualities with you, which I highly encourage you to do, um, you're, you're potentially putting some of those participants at risk. Um, so how do we ac actually operationalize this? Um, the Aragon Network acts as a uh, uh, on-chain organization. It's, it's built on top of Aragon, um, and it's governed by ANT holders. And ANT holders can participate in community governance um, to deploy and allocate shared resources um, to build and maintain uh, core infrastructure um, and service protocols. Um, like the Aragon Court, uh, which we're going to talk about today, um, that coordinate um, agents in the network to perform services. Um, and what this does is it creates a circular economy um, where consumers um, are kind of governing these services and consuming these services, um, and suppliers are providing these services, um, and the Aragon network is really at the core of all of this. Um, so to really like grasp what this means, uh, I know that the language of a service protocol may not be familiar, um, but we see these all the time in the blockchain space. Um, and the reality is, as like a fully digital entity, um, you need to be able to coordinate uh, the activity of people using a protocol. Um, so a service protocol, like uh, examples of this um, could be a proof of stake consensus algorithm, a decentralized oracle protocol, token curated registries, um, or basically anything that, that kind of resembles a, a work token economy. Um, and this is really important because what it does is it commoditizes a service. Um, so as a consumer, you deal with the protocol, and as a service provider, um, you compete um, in an in, uh, undifferentiated market um, to provide a, a very reliable, robust service. Um, and so we can imagine a world where the Aragon network has deployed a myriad of different value-added services that, um, that benefit, benefit Aragon organizations um, and, and drive value and utility to the network. Um, but initially, we need, to, we need to build the first service protocol. Um, and so that's what the research team has been focusing on um, for quite some time. Um, and the first service protocol that we're trying to build is the Aragon Court. And this is a service protocol for dispute resolution. Um, so at a very high level, um, this details how you would participate um, if you wanted to provide arbitration services to the network um, and how disputes would be managed. Uh, so when a dispute comes in, um, you pay dif dispute fees to a court. Um, the court can randomly select um, a subsample of participants that have staked um, to, to participate as a juror. Um, and they can review evidence and claims associated with the dispute. 
um, and come to a verdict. Um, and that verdict can be appealed, and this process can be repeated until we end up with an outcome um, that is equitable um, and, uh, and resolves the dispute. And we'll go into a little bit more detail of that, that process further in this talk. Um, but the key use case and why this is important for on-chain organizations and, and DAOs in general um, is it allows us to create proposal agreements. Um, and if you think of an organization, whether a traditional organization or a fully digital organization, as a group of individuals that have chosen to agree to work towards a, a common goal, uh, whatever that goal is, um, it's important to be able to uh, encode that intent in the organization and ensure that certain types of actions that the, the organization perform comply to that, that intent. Um, so the way this works is that any action that you encode in your DAO, if you're, you're familiar with Aragon now, you've got this permission system. Um, you, can, you can say that funds can only be transferred via, via a vote. Um, if you want to ensure that those, uh, those specific fund transfers actually comply to a specific intent, um, you'd be able to use a proposal agreement to do that. Um, and essentially what this means is that somebody would be able to uh, perform the action only if they agree to the terms uh, of the organization um, and deposit collateral. Um, and so at the organizational level, um, when you're setting up your permissions, in, in addition to just being able to decide how, uh, how actions are performed by vote or by individual, um, you can specify human-readable terms, um, a required collateral deposit, and an arbitration oracle like the Aragon Court um, to enforce the agreement. Um, and why is this so important? Um, this, uh, this means that we have subjective constraints. Um, and when you, you think about governance, uh, it's all about constraining the possible set of actions that can happen and the process in which those actions occur. Um, and when you're dealing with an on-chain organization, most of those constraints are determined by smart contracts. So if you're running an Aragon organization today, all of the constraints that you can configure are based on things that we encode in the underlying smart contracts. Um, but some actions are indistinguishable at the smart contract layer. Um, an example of this is sending funds to an address. Um, from the, the perspective of a smart contract, you can't tell if you're sending funds to a bounty contract, to an employee or a contractor, um, or if you're just the, the majority stakeholders in an organization, you've decided to take all of the resources and give them to yourselves. Um, the, the smart contract can't tell the difference. Um, and so we need to be able to ap apply something at the, the human subjective layer um, that constrains the types of actions based on those contexts. Um, similarly, um, all of these things are built on software. This is a software platform for running an organization, and we know that software needs to be upgraded over time. Um, maintenance and improvement is inevitable. Um, but if you're able to upgrade the, the underlying software that encodes what the organization is, you can change all of those rules. Um, you can change the, the fundamental constraints that are um, uh, coordinating the organization's activity. Um, and so we need a, so another subjective layer that says, OK, we're going to allow upgrades to these contracts that are bug fixes and maintenance that have followed a specific process. But if you try and upgrade this to a, a new system, a new rule set, um, that is not allowed. Um, so we think this is such a fundamental uh, requirement for these on-chain organizations um, that pretty much every organization is going to need this to some degree. And so we want to integrate this very tightly into the, the Aragon experience. So when you perform an action, um, you can be prompted um, to review the terms that are associated with that specific action, um, collateralize an agreement, um, review the arbitration process that, that governs that, um, and then move forward with your action. Um, so this is a, a seamless experience that can be built within uh, an Aragon organization. Um, and one way to think of this is the ability to protect the rights of minority and passive participants when you're uh, when you're collaborating. Um, so right now, if you create an organization uh, on Aragon or elsewhere, um, if there aren't any subjective constraints, if there isn't an agreement that's enforced, um, as a minority or passive participant, you have to have full faith in your um, majority counterparty, um, not to kind, of the, to kind of obey the, the intent that you guys have all agreed to. Um, similarly, if you're a, a passive participant in one of these organizations, um, you're, you're trusting that there's an honest majority that's going to kind of look out for your interests. Um, but with this, this mechanism, 
um, you can take that assumption that there's an honest majority and you can turn it into an assumption that there's an honest individual. So if you're a minority stakeholder, you've got the guarantee that you can always raise, raise the red flag, create a dispute, and prevent like a malicious uh, action um, from taking place. Um, and as a passive individual, you don't need to uh, worry about an honest majority. You just need to ha have one honest person that's actively looking at this that's got your back. Um, and that's huge. Um, so that's the, the value proposition for this Aragon court, this digital jurisdiction, uh, and this, this idea of a service protocol. Um, but service protocols only work uh, if they're compelling, not just to the people that are going to consume the service, but also for the people that are going to provide the service. Um, so to understand that and understand how this protocol is going to, to function and operate and be reliable, we need to understand the implications for people that are participating as service providers as well. Um, so if you're trying to participate as a jury, if you want to provide arbitration services, um, what you're going to need to do is acquire a staking token um, for the, the specific instance of the court. And you can do that by depositing ANT into a bonding curve, uh, which gives you a, a court-specific token, and that uh, court-specific token um, can be staked uh, to make you eligible for jury selection. Um, and what this represents to somebody that's participating is a opportunity cost of capital. Um, they're taking something that is valuable, they're locking it up in order to participate, um, in order for the, the, the privilege to participate in this, this mechanism. Um, and they could take that, that capital and they could apply it somewhere else. They may be able to earn a return. So when we, th we think about this protocol, we need to make sure that we're compensating the people that are participating for that opportunity cost of capital. Um, and that can inform how we structure fees and we, we structure awards in the protocol. Um, the other cost uh, and, and thing that we're asking a juror to do when they participate is to actually resolve disputes. Um, so when a dispute comes in and a juror is selected, they're going to have to evaluate the claims they're going to have to review the, the terms of the agreement, um, and they're going to have to like, make a judgment call uh, on the subjective intent um, and come to a resolution. And they're, they're only going to get rewarded um, if they, they perform this, uh, this service well. Um, so there's a risk that they, they make the wrong judgment call. They're not in the majority of, of jurors and they don't get rewarded. So there's an uh, opportunity cost associated with their time uh, an effort involved in actually performing the, this duty, and some sort of risk involved with uh, potentially performing it um, not as well as they intended. Um, and so those are, uh, those are costs associated with providing the service that need to be compensated as well. Um, and one of the ways that we can minimize the costs, both for, both for jurors and then consequently for consumers of the protocol, is to minimize the amount of effort um, and, and time associated with resolving each individual dispute. Um, and so that's why in the, the protocol we allow for appeals. We don't immediately select everybody that's participating a, as a juror and have them review every single case. Um, initially, when a dispute occurs, we select a very small sample um, and they provide a resolution. If that resolution is uh, found to be like reasonable um, and there isn't an appeal, um, then we've managed to resolve this dispute at a relatively low cost in terms of time, effort, and capital. Um, but in the event that there is uh, uh, a challenge to that, like if one of the counterparties isn't happy with the, the resolution, um, they can send some additional fees to compensate an additional set of jurors. We can retry the case with a larger, uh, larger set. And, and this process can, can basically continue um, until we've selected all of the jurors um, that have staked in this network. Um, and every single juror is then stating their, uh, their opinion, they're committing to a specific outcome or resolution. Um, in some ways, this means that like, disputes are resolved um, based on an honest majority assumption of the jurors in the, the arbitration network, um, which is nice because this is um, neutral relative to the organization in question, um, but it's still an honest majority assumption. Um, so we'd like to improve that as well. Um, so what we're looking at doing um, in, the event the, the, in the event that a dispute actually goes through that entire appeals process and every juror in the network is committed to a specific outcome, um, we can actually split those, uh, those two sets of jurors into two instances of the court that are completely independent, tied to a, an independent bonding curve. Um, and then we can decide the, uh, the outcome of that dispute, not by the, the majority consensus of those jurors, um, but actually through a Futarchy decision. Um, and this changes the assumption from an honest majority of jurors to uh, a, uh, an economic incentive for all um, market in, in, uh, interested participants to bet on the outcome. 
Um, so if you're not familiar with Qtarchy, the, the basic idea is if you have a, a binary choice, um, and that binary choice is closely tied to a very specific success metric, um, and you think that um, making that decision will have a direct correlation with that specific metric that you can quantify and measure, um, then you can uh, create two prediction markets and, sh and pick the option that is predicted to have the, the desired effect on, your, on the metric that you're tracking. Uh, so in this particular case, the, the metric can be the predicted amount of aggregate fees um, in court A or court B, these two instances with completely separate jurors and, and distinct uh, sources of truth in terms of their, their history and precedence of dispute resolution, um, and pick the one that the market um, believes is going to be the most popular in the next uh, three-month period. Um, so, so we get some assurances that uh, we're not just relying on an honest majority of these jurors, we're actually relying on market incentives um, in, a, in a truly decentralized fashion. Um, so th that's kind of the, the fundamental uh, expectations for jurors in the network and, and what their costs are. Um, but in order for this protocol to work, we need to actually compensate them for their, their time. We need to collect fees through the protocol in order to, to make this self-sustainable. Um, and so there's three types of fees that we track in, in the arbitration protocol. And the first is a standard fee. Um, and this is split between the Aragon network. It provides revenue for the Aragon network to compensate them for the maintenance and development of the protocol. Um, and all stake jurors, um, even if they're not participating in a dispute. Um, and this fee is collected any time somebody creates an agreement and specifies the court as the arbitration oracle. Um, so you're, you're paying for this as you're using the protocol, but not as you're creating disputes. Um, and this, this shares the burden of, uh, of providing the service across everybody that's getting value, and not necessarily those that are just um, raising disputes. Um, and this can cover the opportunity cost of the, the capital associated with participating, um, but it doesn't really cover the cost, uh, the time cost of creating disputes. Um, so the second and third uh, types of fees that we collect are dispute fees and appeals fees, and these are collected when a dispute actually occurs, um, and they're intended to compensate for the time cost associated and the risk associated with actually resolving the disputes. Um, so we kind of anticipate that the bulk of the revenue from the court when it's working well com will come from standard fees um, because dispute resolution protocols are actually less used the more reliable and effective they are. Um, you're much less likely to raise a dispute if you think that the dispute is going to be, be resolved effectively. You're, you're more likely to um, work with your counterparty and, and come to an arrangement. Um, so as I mentioned in the beginning, our goal with the project is actually to transition from governance at like an association and project level to governance by a truly decentralized autonomous organization. Um, and so we'd like to use this, uh, this service protocol to help us move closer in that direction. Um, so as uh, Luis and Stefano mentioned, our current process for governance of the project um, enables ANT holders to participate um, by submitting proposals to the association. And the association reviews these proposals to see if they're uh, they're eligible to be included on a ballot, and then ANT holders can approve or reject that. And the role of the association here is imposing those subjective constraints that we're trying to enable uh, with proposal agreements. Um, so we can actually start to phase out that role in the process um, once the, the Aragon court comes online, um, and we, we can replace the, the need to review pr proposals for, for fit uh, from a centralized entity like the association um, to a uh, a system of proposal agreements and dispute resolution processes. Um, and this creates the basic foundation for like a, a V1 version of the network. If the current AGP process is Aragon Network V0, um, this would be Aragon Network V1. Um, and it, it provides a foundation, but we can always improve on our governance processes. Um, in addition to this, we can allow ANT holders to delegate their vote um, rather than voting directly um, to allow more flexibility in terms of how people participate in the process. Um, we can potentially experiment with other options as well, um, but the idea is that governance processes are fluid um, and, they, and subject to some specific constraints to protect minority and passive participants. They should be evolving and improving over time. Um, and with that said, I'm going to invite Bingen up on the stage, uh, who's been uh, helping me uh, in the research and development of this, um, to talk about the scope of our Aragon Network V1 launch and our plans for uh, moving forward. Thanks, Luke.
Hi. Well, thanks, Luke. Uh, so now I want to give you a brief overview of how this Network V1 is going to work at the technical level. Uh, the scope for the Aragon Network is going to be comprised by four big elements, which are the core pilot, uh, the staking app, the proposal agreements, and the delegative voting, which we'll see better in the next slide. So for the core pilot, we're going to use a FLEROS system. Uh, you probably know already that FLEROS did a nice experiment. Uh, essentially, they had like a curated list of DOSH uh, where you had to try to sneak a cat and fool other participants and jurors. And it was uh, real fun. We were, uh, we were looking at it closely. And, and but most importantly, it was working well. So for the first version, we're going to use this FLEROS system. And we will see eventually in the future if we, uh, if we stick to it or not. Uh, this Kledos uh, system, um, well, th they promoted uh, uh, an interface. This is the ERC-792, which has two parts, the arbitrator and the arbitrable. The arbitrator is the one that it's like the court itself. So where you have like, where you create the disputes and the appeals, so where you have the jurors. And so that would be like the one that we would use for the court. And it has a couple of very interesting things. One is that they, they implemented a random RAM gener generator uh, for selecting the jurors. And that's, that's really interesting because you know that randomness is kind of hard in blockchain. And then they have this sortition algorithm for also for selecting the jurors using some trees uh, for token weighted selection, which is pretty neat. Uh, I think you should check it out online. Um, and then, well, th uh, they use their native token, which is Pinakion. Uh, instead of that, we're going to use this uh, ANJ token that Luke talked about. Uh, this ANJ token, as Luke said, is going to be tied to a bonding curve to, to our ANT token. Uh, I would like to mention here that for this bonding curve, we may use an implementation that Olivier from Pando I think he's around, one of our test teams uh, did. So again, reusing some code. Uh, how beautiful is open source, right? So yeah, and the other side of this, of this interface, we have the proposal agreement. Is this new contract we are building. Uh, it implements the other side of the, of the interface, which is the arbitrable, uh, which is going gonna, it's, it's gonna to enforce the outcomes of the juror's decisions. Uh, in this contract, the proposal agreements, uh, users will create the proposals, and if they think that they need to, they would create the disputes and the appeals. So this proposal agreement is going to be talking to the Kleros Liquid, to the core system, to create the disputes in one direction and to rule or enforce the outcomes in the other one. Also, this uh, proposal agreement is, is going to talk to the deliberative voting app for creating the votes and posing them and canceling them in case of uh, the jurors say so. Uh, this uh, simple single delegation voting app, this is uh, an evolution of our current uh, voting app. Uh, we, uh, we try to implement a liquid democracy, but we haven't been able yet to figure out all the scalability issues. So this is like, a, like an in-between step uh, that has some important advantages, especially it allows for more passive participants to take part of it. And also, it makes it easier for using cold wallets, which is important. We, we saw that now with this AGP voting. <coughs> and also, uh, uh, the proposal agreement is going to act as a log manager for the staking app. And I would like to highlight some, some things about this staking app. This staking app is our second iteration. Uh, we did our first one uh, in the scope of our uh, modular TCR implementation. And <coughs> that one was uh, too complicated. Uh, we're using uh, locking for anti-civil protection, which something called overlocking was, was too complex, was not working, uh, especially if you wanted to use it for several applications. So it's principle to the rescue. Uh, now we are doing this second version. It's going to be a core component, not only of Aragon Network, but even beyond, for two reasons mainly. Uh, first one is because it's going to it's, it's going to be used by multiple use cases like liquid democracy, single delegation voting, uh, TCR, the proposal agreements, of course. Uh, essentially, anything where you need to 
either prove a token balance or even potentially slash tokens that did uh, yeah well and, and the second reason is because uh, it's likely going to secure a huge amount of funds so we're gonna make sure that everything's fine so and I was saying these are the two main features of this uh, of this staking app first one is the anti-civil protection that now we are using uh, checkpointing or history is something like mini tokens uh, kind of similar <coughs> and then the slashing mechanism that is going to work through locking but no locking uh, as a, uh, um, unlike the previous one is uh, is the couple the logic is a couple so any app using this uh, locking system can uh, implement their own rules and it's way more flexible so this sticking app is complying with uh, ERC 900 interface that you probably already know that was promoted by Jorge among others uh, with the optional history part and, <coughs> and also a locking interface that uh, this is uh, this, this is new and we're, we're planning to publish it make it make it public once we think that it's uh, mature and and general enough for everybody to use uh, well, we don't, we don't have much time to get into all the technical details, but well, you know, openness is one of the core values of Aragon. So everything that we are talking about here is being discussed as of right now in this forum, uh, our forum. So yeah, I encourage you to check it out and participate because in the end, this network is for everybody, right? So yeah, go ahead. And yeah, and well, so the question used to be at least internally when mainnet and uh, this has been solved we are on mainnet now uh, so the question now is when network but the thing is we, we don't do dates anymore uh, but <laughs> but uh, still uh, we are confident enough and well Luis said so so we're confident enough that this will be done by the end of the year but most importantly you will be able to follow up the progress online so yeah and yeah, and I would like to finish this uh, this talk with a personal note. Uh, it turns out that today it's my first anniversary. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> thanks, thanks. So that means that like one year ago or a little bit more than two million blogs ago, uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I found that it's better to, to count it in blogs because it reflects how how intense and relative is this crazy crypto space that, that I've been doing this last year. So, and yeah, looking back, uh, I sometimes, uh, the guy here knows, sometimes I remember uh, one picture that Luis tweeted uh, back in September. It was four, four of us lying on the floor of a hotel room and the tweet was saying something like, um, uh, our dev team getting ready for East Berlin Hackathon or something like that. And the important thing that I realized there is that uh, that that was it. That was the dev team, the whole dev team at that moment. So four people. And I have seen with my eyes during this year what this small team has been able to achieve. And, and well, you can see it online, and, and you will see it during these two days. So now we have a solid foundation. We are a minute. We have Aragon OS and all these products that we said. Uh, we are growing, growing up the team with awesome additions and hiring is working really well now. So I cannot even imagine uh, what's gonna happen during this year, but just trust me, uh, stay tuned because it's gonna be amazing. So uh, thank you for being here and enjoy the rest of the conference. Mm -hmm.